The Rose Bowl between Michigan and Alabama is sucking up most of the oxygen or soaking up most of the energy revolving around the college football playoff. And that's understandable. But Washington ranked number two, 13 and 0, and Texas ranked number three and 12 and 1, both champions of the Pac 12 and Big 12, respectively and moving to the Big Ten and the SEC, respectively, in 2024, they have what I think is an incredible matchup on their hands. Two teams who I think have a lot of similarities and a lot of differences, and I think in a certain sense, while the Rose Bowl is the more hyped-up matchup, it's the more highly anticipated matchup, It's the matchup that everyone, including myself, is going to be more focused on, but that's mainly from my perspective because I'm a Michigan fan. This game, I think, has the potential to carry that more all-time classic, high energy, and quality game. You got two great offenses, you have awesome NFL-level line of scrimmage play, and Look, these teams are not the favorites to win it all. That's Michigan and Alabama. So whoever wins the Sugar Bowl is likely going to be an underdog in the national title game. And these are two teams that have not been in the college football playoff conversation or to a college football playoff game in quite some time. So welcome, Texas, and welcome, Washington, to the SEC, to the Big Ten, and also to the national stage. We're going to have an awesome preview and prediction segment here. Grab your popcorn or sit down with your Christmas Eve meal and let's have some fun. Welcome back, fellow football fanatics. It's your host, College Football with Sam. And this year's college football playoff, let me tell you, there's no guarantees. Both of these games could be blowouts, but there seems to be the feeling that this could be the best college football playoff ever so far in the history of college football and potentially in the entire history of the four-team playoff as there will be a 12-team playoff next season. Before we get any deeper into this video, like this video, pardon me, I'm very excited, subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell so that you can get notified when I produce more college football content. There are going to be more videos on this Sugar Bowl matchup. This video is shorter than my typical preview and prediction video. That is intentional. It's going to be about 30 minutes long, I feel, unlike the typical 40, 45, or 50-minute video. But there will be one that is that length later in the week where I go more in-depth to my prediction, give some reasons why I think my winner why I think that they will win, and you'll have to watch this whole video to find out who I'm predicting to win. But anyway, hit the notification bell if you want to get notified when I release that video, and also some more videos talking about the intriguing matchups and why each team can win, because the team that I'm picking to lose this game has a variety of reasons why they could win and why I could be wrong about them. Comment your thoughts, analysis, and your prediction down in the comment section below. Share this video around. If you're a Washington fan especially, I encourage you to subscribe, as this is mainly a Big Ten channel, and therefore your team is going to be front and center covered in college football with Sam. And lastly, if you want to support the channel and gain some access to some bonus content, depending on your tier, check out my Patreon page via the link in the description and the pinned comment. And also in the description and the pinned comment, there will be a video that I think sets up this video nicely. I made this video a few days ago talking about Texas and Washington and giving really a deep preview and analysis with a lot of analytics and statistics without giving a prediction. And I think it sets up this video quite nicely. So I'm going to link this video down in the description below and a pinned comment, and also on the top right corner of your screen, there should be an information card that's popping up right now. You can click on that, and it will link to this video. It's about 50 minutes long, which is very long, but if you want that in-depth preview 
and arguments for both teams and that comparison where I'm feeding you information to help you make the decision of who's the better team. And if you think that both of these coaching staffs are great and both teams are going to bring their best game, which is typically what happens in the college football playoff, then whoever you think the best team is should win. Though that doesn't always happen, as in the case of Michigan and TCU last season, or trying to think of some other games where that happened. Um, I, I can't. Um, sadly, my team, of course, is one of the running jokes in terms of national title contention, whether it's getting blown out by Georgia or losing to TCU. But we're not really talking about Michigan here. That was for the Rose Bowl preview and prediction segment. This is the Sugar Bowl preview and prediction segment. Let's look at the matchup between these two teams. This game will obviously be played in the Sugar Bowl. Both teams are conference champions. Washington's 13-0. Texas is 12-1. This is fascinating. Despite being 13-0, playing a tougher strength of schedule than Texas, Washington is a a 4.5-point underdog, and according to ESPN's FPI, it should be closer to a whole touchdown underdog. The Huskies are not even top 10 in FPI. Very similar situation to TCU last year in terms of power ranking placement. The difference is Washington's undefeated, and TCU wasn't last season. I also think if you watch both of these teams, it is clear that Washington has a higher ceiling than last year's TCU team, and in particular, they have a much better and more sound defense, but that's beside the point. Texas here, top 10 in FPI, still not top four, though. There are two teams in the top four of FPI who are not in the college football playoff, and those teams are Ohio State at two and Penn State at three. FPI has been lower on the SEC this season and higher on the Big Ten, and actually higher on the Big 12 because Oklahoma is at number eight in FPI. Just some interesting stuff. By... Power ranking standards, Texas should win this game. They're given a 69.2% chance to win. So FPI is saying right now, 7 out of 10 times, Texas would win this game. That's in comparison to Michigan-Alabama, where Michigan's given about 55% chance to win. So that's either 5, 5.5, or 6 out of 10 times Michigan is projected to win the Rose Bowl. By power ranking standards... This is the game that has a greater chance of getting out of control in favor of Texas, and the Rose Bowl, theoretically, should be the closer game. But what's interesting is from my channel, the perspective of my channel and my subscriber base, Washington has a greater percentage of people picking them to outright win in comparison to Michigan over Alabama. The general public, I think has somewhat of a sentiment that this game, maybe it's not that they're going to be closer necessarily than the Rose Bowl, this matchup, but that Washington should be the favorite, that, that the wrong team is favored. I do kind of get that feeling here, but I don't know exactly. 60% of y'all in my community polls, which, by the way, vote on the community polls because your vote matters and it's counted here. About 60% of you picked Washington, 40% picked Texas, Nine, 960 people picked Texas, and about 1,440 picked Washington. These teams are going to try new things. And Michigan and Alabama, I think, have the better head coaches, and I think overall they have the better coaching staffs in a certain sense. But Washington and Texas have elite offensive schemers. You know, Steve Sarkeesian drawing up his plays and Ryan Grubb and Kalen DeBoer collaborating on one of the most unique and insane offenses in college football. I'm very fascinated to see how these teams will pick apart opposing defenses and also how involved the offensive play callers at least off the field, are going to be involved with helping their defenses prepare against very complex offenses. Sometimes offenses that I think, especially in the case of Texas, are too complex for their own good. The over-under in this game is 63.5 right now. Um, I'm not 
extremely confident on this, and I'm not someone who bets, but if you're going to bet, I'd be tempted to pick the over here, because both of these offenses are better than both of these defenses, and these offenses have some matchup advantages over opposing defenses that are quite fascinating. From a power rankings angle, obviously, Texas, big-time favorite. Looking at Action Network here, and I didn't exactly do this for Alabama and Michigan because I feel like the sentiment around who's going to win from the public has been stronger, leaning heavily toward Alabama. But looking here, according to Action Network, this game's going to be played also on New Year's Day, it's pretty even. 55% of the bets are on Washington right now to cover. 45% are on Texas, and that's just in terms of spread. So there's a, there's more balance from a public standpoint relating to this game. But obviously, the public thinks the wrong team is favored in this game. And also, to a certain degree, against Alabama and Michigan, though the spread there is tighter and Michigan analytically should be favored by more against Alabama in the same way that Texas should be favored by more analytically against Washington. This is a game where I'm less confident in picking my winner than I am in the Rose Bowl. But you'll have to watch the Rose Bowl preview and prediction video to get my pick. But I'm less confident about this game and making a pick here than I am about the Rose Bowl. And a large part of that is because, positionally, these two teams are equal in a lot of ways. I think Washington dominates offensively, and I think Texas dominates defensively. It's just that simple. And Washington has a lead in staff. I think they have the better head coach. I think they have the better offensive staff. And I think they have the better strength and conditioning staff. But Pete Kwiatkowski and his defensive staff are great. Texas is analytically and statistically speaking the top rushing defense in the college football playoff. And that could bode them well in the national championship game. But I'm curious to see how it will do or will it matter at all against a Washington offense that is perfectly content with abandoning the run and going completely pass heavy. Kalen DeBoer right now is the winningest head coach in terms of win percentage in college football, like counting all of his wins and losses and, uh, you know, finding what his win percentage is. And he's the highest, number one in that category. Winningest sound a little, sounded a little deceiving. That's my bad. Um, he's not the winningest in terms of national champions or total wins, but just in terms of win percentage. He is number one. Kalen DeBoer finds ways to win. And Washington this season in games against Arizona, Oregon, Arizona State, Stanford, USC, Utah, Oregon State, Washington State, and Oregon. Uh, that right there is, that's nine. That is not nine total games out of Washington's 13 have been won by 10 points or less. And Washington, in those games, those are games that are either close games or games where Washington controlled the game but didn't necessarily outright dominate, they're 9-0 in those matchups. This staff knows how to win football games. Texas, meanwhile, their staff, I don't want to be too hard on them, but they've let dominant performances turn into near choke jobs. And I think that's more of a reflection on the coaching staff than the players. Texas has a lot more talent star-wise, at virtually every position compared to Washington, including at quarterback, where Penix, I think, was a three- or maybe four-star, but I'm pretty sure three-star recruiter of high school. Quinn Ewers was the number one player of the 2021 recruiting class, even after reclassifying. At quarterback, speaking of that, I give the quarterback position to Washington. Michael Penix Jr., he had fallen off after a really impressive start to the regular season, but he's still 10th in QBR, 33 passing touchdowns, 9 interceptions, 4,218 passing yards, and a 161.4 passer rating. 
Compare that to Quinn Ewers, who has 3,161 passing yards, 21 passing touchdowns, 6 interceptions, and a 78.7 QBR. He has a higher passer rating with a 162.6, but I look at Texas and Quinn Ewers' quarterback play and the schedule that they've faced, and I look at what Michael Penix is doing, 554 passing attempts compared to Ewers, 351. I think Penix does have a better system, yes, but he also needs to carry a much bigger load every game. And in big games, he shows up. Against Oregon, he had a 91.6 quarterback efficiency rating in the regular season and an 87.6 quarterback efficiency rating in the game against Oregon in the Pac-12 championship game, second time around. Against USC, big road game. It was after Washington struggled in back-to-back games against Arizona State and Stanford. 160 passer rating, 90 quarterback efficiency rating, made a Heisman-level throw. Against Utah and Oregon State, he combined for four total touchdowns and an average quarterback efficiency rating of about an 85. In big games, Penix shows up. He does. And Quinn Ewers, good quarterback, maybe great quarterback, but in his bigger games, Oklahoma being the biggest one, Alabama, he did good as well, but a lot of those receivers were wide open. Still got to give him credit. Alabama, he did well, 90.9 quarterback efficiency rating, torched an Alabama defense that has impressive NFL talent at defensive back, linebacker. Against Oklahoma, though, 31 of 37, one touchdown, two picks, also a fumble, and then against Texas Tech, TCU, through through combined two picks in those games, he looked lethargic at times against Houston, against Kansas. He threw an interception. He has a worse TDINT ratio than Jalen Milrow and J.J. McCarthy. And I would rather have the additional 12 touchdown passes from Penix along with the additional three interceptions. Um, I think Quinn Ewers, and Texas fans won't like me for this. They complained about this in the other video. I do think that he is the worst quarterback in the college football playoff. And I've spent a lot of time, perhaps more than I should have, on quarterback. But both of these teams are much more reliant on their quarterbacks to win games than, let's say, Alabama and Michigan are. At running back, I have to give this spot to Texas, even with Jonathan Brooks' injury. I think that the Longhorns overall are just so good at running the football. It's what they do best. They have C.J. Baxter, who has almost 600 rushing yards. He's averaging 4.6 yards per carry, four rushing touchdowns. And Jaden Blue and Keelan Robinson are also solid running backs, along with Savion Red. They have a deep running back room. Washington essentially has Dylan Johnson and maybe Will Nixon and Tybo Rogers. And Dylan Johnson... He's playing behind a better offensive line. I think C.J. Baxter is probably as good as Dylan Johnson is. Dylan Johnson has 1,113 rushing yards, 14 rushing touchdowns, and he's averaging 5.5 yards per carry. Texas, before Jonathan Brooks went down, had one of the best rushing offenses in the country, and I compared it to a light edition of Michigan's 2022 rushing offense. At wide receiver and tight end, tight end was tough because of Jatavion Sanders, but I prefer Washington's depth. At wide receiver, I don't think this was as tough as tight end. Xavier Worthy is good. Same with Adani Mitchell and Jordan Whittington. Uh, they don't have a Roma Dunze. They don't. And Jalen McMillan and Jalen Polk are also just awesome receivers. And Jeremy Bernard as well. All four of those receivers have over 30 receptions, over 300 receiving yards. Polk and Adunze have more than 1,000 receiving yards, and Adunze has 13 receiving touchdowns. Polk has 8 receiving touchdowns, and Polk and Adunze are averaging over 16 yards per reception. So this offense for Washington is explosive. I think it's the best passing offense in the entire country, and that's not me just taking into account that I think they're number one in passing yards per game. It's just watching them and using the eye test. I'm no doubt impressed with their passing offense. Washington won the Joe Moore Award for their offensive line, which means, according to 
the Joe Moore Award coaches and you know beat writers who vote on these things that Washington is the best O line in the country, and I would agree with that. I think it it was either Washington, Oregon, or Georgia. And Oregon and Georgia didn't look good in their championship games on the O-line. Washington did. Texas, however, does have a great offensive line, especially in terms of running the football. I'd say Texas has a slight edge over Washington in terms of run blocking. I would, however, say that Washington has a massive advantage over Texas in pass blocking. Defensively on the D-line and at linebacker as well, I think Texas's front is superior to Washington's. Washington only has 19 sacks on the season, but their pressure rate is higher than their sack rate. Texas, 32 32 sacks. Almost said 32%. My bad. 32 sacks. They are able to get pressure, but perhaps more importantly than that, the Longhorns have Tavondre Sweat. They have Byron Murphy II. And Byron Murphy II, five sacks. Defensive tackle with five sacks. Ethan Burke, defensive end, five and a half sacks. Texas can get pressure. More importantly, though, they can shut down the run. And they, I'm telling you, Murphy and Sweat are NFL, All-American caliber defensive linemen. No one is running without blood, sweat, and tears through that interior Texas defensive line. Washington... They have Braylon Trice, and they have great players on that defensive line. Those 19 sacks do not give the Washington D-line justice whatsoever. Also, ZTF, Zion Zion Tupola Fatui at defensive end with three and a half sacks. He's good, but I am giving Texas that edge overall in the D-line because even though I think Washington has the better pass rushers at defensive end, I think Texas, their upside at defensive tackle, no one can really compare to the upside they have at defensive tackle in this matchup or anyone on Washington or Texas's schedule has even close to the interior presence defensively that the Longhorns have. It's incredibly impressive what Texas's defense has done over the past two seasons. They've really transformed. We have not seen a Texas defense that is this strong. We haven't. Now, they're not without weaknesses. Both of these defenses have their weakness in the secondary, where both are outside of the top 100 in multiple categories. Um, Nothing short of passing attempts allowed per game, completions allowed per game, etc. And both are outside of the top 25 in passer rating allowed per game. But I give the edge to Washington here. Because Texas is able to generate more pressure. Texas is able to shut down opposing run games in a way that Washington just cannot, even though they also have a good run defense. And despite that, and despite the fact that Texas has played inferior quarterbacks, like Jalen Milrow early in the season, not good. Alan Bowman, not good. Um, Whoever TCU's quarterback was because Chandler Morris got hurt. I forget his name. He's not good. They played Jason Bean and not Jaden Daniels. Bean is one of the better quarterbacks along with Dylan Gabriel they've played all season. And those two are nothing compared to Bo Nix, who Washington played twice. And despite all of that, and also the fact that Washington played Caleb Williams, DJ Uyunglele, Noah Fafita, those all are top 10 quarterbacks. Williams, Fafita... Knicks, Washington is still overall better in passer rating allowed, and I think completions and passing attempts allowed per game. So I give Washington the edge at secondary. Defensively, the Huskies on the season have 56 passes defended and 16 picks. Texas has 50 passes defended and 16 picks as well. And then on special teams, Texas is the better kicker in Burt Auburn, who has made 28 field goals on the season. Comparison with Washington, who Grady Gross has only made 13 out of 17 as a lower field goal percentage. And Bird Auburn has also hit a long of 54. So I give the edge to Texas on special teams. Some players to watch in this game. Tavondre Sweat at defensive tackle for Texas and Michael Penix Jr. at quarterback for Washington. 
And those are the two main players. But also look out for C.J. Baxter for Texas. Because you can run on Washington to a certain degree. I say that very calmly and slowly because, look, USC was able to have some success. Oregon was able to have some success. But then again, Washington doesn't always like to bring pressure. Their focus is not on their defense. And they're content with allowing you to get yards. They just want to bow. They want to bow up. They want to let the field compress and then do damage. And against Oregon, Oregon, in my mind, was the best offensive line before the Pac-12 championship game. And Washington just completely ate them up and spit them out of their mouth with, you know, bones, organs that are inedible, and everything. I mean, they, they killed that offensive line. So I'm curious to see how C.J. Baxter and that Texas offensive line will fare against Washington's defense. Some other players for Texas to look out for in particular, I think, is Adani Mitchell. Adani Mitchell is Texas's deep receiver. He's averaging 15.9 yards per reception right now. Xavier Worthy leads the team in receptions by a mile with 73, but A.D. Mitchell also has 10 receiving touchdowns. I loved A.D. Mitchell at Georgia and how he came alive in big moments in the playoff, and he has been a lot more consistent this year at Texas than ever before at Georgia, and I think that he'll match up well with Washington's secondary. We'll just have to see how... Washington's defensive backs, in particular Jabbar Muhammad, do against players like Adani Mitchell and Xavier Worthy. But going back to to Vondre Sweat, he has two sacks, 42 total tackles, five passes defended. He's going to be a high-level draft pick and honestly might be the best defensive player in the country. He's my key player to watch because Washington, surprisingly, is able to run the ball quite efficiently. On the season, they've averaged 4.5 yards per carry. They've ran for 26 touchdowns, and they've ran for 1,628 yards. And Dylan Johnson, in particular, has come on the season as the season's gone on. He's averaging 5.5 yards per carry. He's had 100-yard games against Oregon twice against USC, Utah as well. He had four rushing touchdowns against USC. And against Oregon State, he nearly had 100 rushing yards. And against Washington State and also Stanford, he nearly had 100 rushing yards. Same with Arizona. So he really began to emerge in the middle to late part of the season. And he's only fumbled twice, only lost one fumble. Junior, six foot, 218 pounds. Washington can run the football, and if Tavondre Sweat and Texas's defensive line struggle to stop Washington's rushing attack, which would be shocking, but it's possible, imagine how Washington is going to use that run attack to even further open up their passing attack, which already matches up well against a poor Texas secondary. So it's it's critical for Texas defensively to ensure that Washington is one-dimensional, and to try and ensure that with only minimal pressure or bringing minimal men forward so that you can have as many people in coverage as possible to compensate for a secondary that is just not that efficient. And speaking of the pass defense, let's look at Washington's pass offense, the main threat to Texas. Michael Penix Jr. is a top-10 quarterback, He finished second in the 2023 Heisman race behind Jaden Daniels, who just had an all-time great season at quarterback this year. Michael Penix, he has had some off games and off performances, and there are drives where he will overthrow receivers or he'll make, you know, one bad decision and force it into the arms of a defender. He did that against Oregon, like, in both matchups. He did that against Oregon in the regular season game when Washington had a chance to go up by double digits. At half, he threw a completely misguided ball to an Oregon defensive back, and he did it again in the Pac-12 championship game. 
Now, I think Oregon has a better secondary, a much better secondary, in fact, than Texas, but they don't have the same ability to shut down the run. Washington in both games was able to use the run consistently to keep Oregon's defense honest. And again, Texas doesn't have Oregon's secondary, and I think Oregon even has a better pass rush than Texas, but they don't have the same interior presence. I think that Texas can and potentially will make Washington one-dimensional, and that will force Michael Penix Jr. to play a near-perfect game. And that's sort of a basic requirement already when you're playing in the college football playoff, is to play at your highest level. So for the Huskies, it comes down to Michael Penix Jr. and also, obviously, Roma Dunze, who has over 1,000 receiving yards. And defensively, I'd say Braylon Trice and Jabbar Muhammad. Can Washington get pressure with Trice and with Zion Tupola Fatui, the defensive ends? And when Quinn Ewers does make a throw, whether deep, whether intermediate, whomever likely to A.D. Mitchell or to Xavier Worthy, his favorite target, where will Jabbar Muhammad be? And will he be able to defend Texas's receivers? These are questions that will need to be answered, and I think Washington will answer more questions than Texas will. This is a very tough game to pick, though. I am, again, more confident in my pick for the Rose Bowl than I am for my pick in the Sugar Bowl. I could see Texas winning this game. I easily could. And I think the Longhorns will rush for 150-plus yards, and they'll pass for 250-plus. But their red zone performance is questionable. This is one of Texas's key weaknesses all season. Their red zone defense is ridiculously good. Their red zone offense is porous. That's why Burt Auburn has so many field goals, is Texas uses their ground game. But when you have a run-heavy offense like Texas does, and you don't perfect third down conversions with passes... You can drive down the field in between the 20s, but once you get inside the 20, the field compresses, you then start to run into problems. And Texas against Oklahoma State and Texas Tech didn't have those same problems, but Oklahoma State's defense allows more, fun fact, they allow more yards per game than Michigan State's defense does. And Michigan State's defense sucked this season. Just a Big Ten comparison right there. Against good teams, good defenses, whether it was Oklahoma, even against Alabama to a certain degree. A lot of Texas's touchdowns did come off of turnovers and also some blown coverages. This offense has struggled to produce touchdowns. Washington doesn't have that problem. And that is why I think, along with the fact that they have an amazing matchup against Texas's secondary, I don't know how many yards Washington will run for. Washington could have negative yardage, and because Texas's offense in the red zone is that suspect, and their secondary is bad, I could see Washington still staying in this game, even if they have negative rushing yards, because of the matchups. And I think the Huskies will pass for 400 yards or more, and they will close out the Sugar Bowl by passing to Chew Clock, which they have done multiple times this season, But they're going to do it here, and it will be painfully obvious, and I don't think Texas will be able to stop it regardless. They will pass to Chew Clock, and I will expand upon that point in my longer preview and prediction video where I dive deeper into my prediction, give, you know, really a tier list of reasons as to why I think Washington will win, and also talk more about Texas and how they can win as well. But I think 38-34, this game will hit the over on the total, and Washington will win. And the Huskies' defense will hold Texas to two or more field goals. Texas's defense will struggle to cover Washington's wide receivers. But for now, this is something that I'll probably include in my more in-depth preview and prediction video that'll be an additional 10 to 20 minutes longer as I'll talk about what I think Washington's rushing total will be. As of now, I don't know. Because I could see Texas totally shutting down Dylan Johnson, but because their strength is in stopping the run, that's Washington's weakness on the offensive line anyway, Texas could dominate Washington on the line of scrimmage in the run game, and then Washington still dominates them in pass protection. I mean, the the matchups here 
in this game, I think, are absolutely fascinating. 38-34, Washington over Texas. However, I, I'm not very confident here. Take this prediction with a grain of salt. I just think Washington is better at finding ways to win, and Washington is a massive matchup and schematic advantage here. Thank you all so much for watching this video. Remember to like, subscribe, and click the notification bell. Thanks to Crash2488 for being my Heisman Patreon sponsor for the month of December. Thanks to Spencer Bringers for being my All-American Patreon sponsor for the month of December. Thanks to Will Loftus, Gabriel Callender, Roaming Gnome, Matthew Sale, Chris Lane, Austin Christmas, and Zubin Za for being my All-Conference Patrons of the month of December. Have a phenomenal day, guys. Merry Christmas, and have a good day.